praise the Lord. Thank you for tuning in again. Today, we are on the book of Haggai. Can we turn to the book of Haggai, chapter 1, verse 8, please? This will be my text for this morning. Haggai, chapter 1, verse 8, read like this. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and what? And build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for the power of your word this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we can study your word again. Make your word to become alive today. Open up our ears and our hearts. Speak to us, we pray. Anoint us, we pray. Anoint the speaker, the hearers, and the readers. We ask all this in Jesus powerful and glorious name. Everybody say, Amen and Amen. Shall we begin this book by way of introduction first? Let us consider first of all the person. The name Haggai is given to us right at chapter 1 verse 1. His name means happy or joyous or jovial. So we have looked at the person. Secondly, let us consider the period. Basically, his period of ministry was very short. Only four months of ministry. And after that period, we don't hear anything from him again. I'm sure you can remember the Persian king called King Cyrus, don't you? Under his decree, he told the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Remember? Whoever wants, he said, they can go back. And 50,000 Jews responded. And they went back to their homeland under the leadership of two men as mentioned in this book. One of it was Zerubbabel and the other man was called Joshua, the high priest. Now bear in mind that these Jews were going back purely for spiritual reasons only. Bear in mind the land had been devastated, ruined, Destroy, not even one building was left standing there. And the land was not even cultivated for a period of 70 years. So you can imagine in your mind when all these Jews making their way back to Jerusalem to start the building of the temple, you can imagine the hard life that they are going through. So their first concern was to build an altar. Their second concern was to build a temple. So as they begin to build the temple for the first two years, and after the second year, they stop. Why? Because of the opposition that came from without as well as from within. And the work of God ceased for 15 years. So the whole building project of the temple came to a standstill from 535 BC to 520 BC. Not even one brick was added to the building. And weeds began to grow on the temple site and people's heart began to grow cold and weary and very soon 
they began to put their own interests first ahead of God's business. And this is where we come to our third point, the purpose of the book. We have looked at the person, the period. Now, thirdly, we want to look at the purpose. This is where God sent Haggai, the prophet, and through his four short series of sermonettes, God used it to stir the hearts of the nation back to work again and to finish the work that is in the temple. That is the purpose of this book. So we have looked at the person, the period, the purpose. Now let us look at the pattern. The pattern. The book falls into four parts, as you can see it in this book. Each division has a date, has a date on it. And this is how we are going to divide the book up into four very simple divisions or outlined. The first message is found in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. The second message is found in chapter 2, verse 1, as you can read it. The third message is found in chapter 2, verse 10. And the last message is found in chapter 2, verse 20. So this is how we are going to divide the book, the two chapters, into four different outlines. The first message was directed to the hands of the people. The second message was directed to the hearts, to the hearts of the people. The third message was directed to the holiness of the people. And the last message was directed to the hope of the people. So the hands of the people, the hearts of the people, the holiness of the people, and the hope of the people. Let us begin with our first point. The prophet's message, the first message directed to the heart of the people, this is found in the whole of chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 15. In this section, we're going to see how God stirred the hands of the people so that they can act fast using their hands to rebuild the temple again. First of all, let us see. He called for the summon. Chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 4. Here, God challenged the people, summoned the people, challenged them to court for a debate. He said to them in chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say, The time has not yet come. The time that the lost house should be built. Then verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, verse 4, Then is it time for you yourself to dwell in panel houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So God is simply saying to them, Is it right or wrong? Look and see. You got a house to dwell in. Then now look at my house. My temple, it lies rings. So God asked them this question. Is it right or is it wrong? So God was using question to provoke his people to think, to think, to look at their own house that has been nicely built up and fully furnished. Then now look at God's house, all in rain, abundant. Half finished. God said, is that right or wrong? So we have seen the summon. Now secondly, let us look at number two. The scarcity. The scarcity. Chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7. God said to them, look at what had happened right now. In chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7, God said, you have sown much. You bring in little. 
You eat, you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You close, your, close yourself, but no one is warm. And you earn wages. Your wages is put into a bag with holes. So that say the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God was asking them now, look, what happened? What happened? Why you don't have enough all the time? Why you earn so much and as if like you're putting into the bag that are full of holes? What actually has happened? God asked them to consider. God asked them to think why they always not having enough. Why there is a food shortage. Why they eat and they are not full. So God was asking them a question to challenge them to think. So we have seen the summon. We have seen the scarcity. Now number three, God told them it was because of his sentence. Sentence, his judgment. This is found in chapter 1, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. He said, God said, you look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, what happened? That four words, God said, I blew it away. So God was telling them that he was the one that causes them not to have enough. Look at chapter 1, verse 10 and verse 11. God said, therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, the earth withhold its crop. For I call for a drought to come on the land and on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Why all these things happen? The answer is simple. Because of God's sentence. God was judging His people. Look at your life today. Is your life similar to this incident as well? Are you experiencing the same thing today as what the children of Israel had experienced back then. Ask yourself, could this be you are also under his sentence of judgment as well? So we have seen the summon, number two, the scarcity, number three, the sentence, now number four. Let us look at the stress. Chapter one, verse nine, the second part. So why all these things are happening? God was asking his people. The answer is very simple. Look at chapter 1 verse 9, the second part. You look for much, it came in little, you brought it home, I blew it away. Verse 9 says, why? God says it is because of my house that is in ruins. Wow! Every one of you, every one of you runs to his own house. Can you see here? God is doing a comparison. God is telling them why all these calamities happen in their life. The reason is because of what? It's because that their focus is at the wrong place. They emphasize at the wrong thing and the stress it's not on the right thing itself. God is telling them, you have to focus on my work. God is telling them, you have to focus on my house. But the people were focusing on their individual houses. That's why God, is, God was judging them. That's why the heaven is withholding their dew and rain and the earth withholding their crops. All because God called for the drought to come on the land, thus saith the Lord. 
So we have seen the summon, the scarcity, the lack, the sentence, that is the judgment, the strength because their focus was wrong. Now look at fifthly, the suggestion. Chapter 1, verse 8. So what was the suggestion given by God here? Chapter 1, verse 8. God told them, you have to go up to the mountain. Yes, every one of you, go up to the mountain, bring wood and start building the temple. And I will take pleasure in it and be glorified, saith God. So, we have seen the summon. Number two, the scarcity. Number three, the sentence. Number four, the stress. Number five, the suggestion. Now look at it lastly. The submission. The submission. Chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 15. Look at the response of the people. When they hear through the prophet Haggai concerning the word of God, what was their response? The Bible say point one, the work resumed back. Look at chapter 1 verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sittel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, look at the word, obey, obey the voice of the Lord their God, and they obey the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him. You see, because of obedience, they begin to put their hands into the work of God again. So the work of God was resumed back and they start working on God's work. So the first point, the work resumed. Secondly, let us look at the work reaffirmed. And God said to them, chapter 2, verse 13, Then Haggai, the lost messenger, spoke the lost message to the people saying, What did God say? You see how God reaffirmed the people he says, I am with you, says the Lord. So you see, when you and I choose to obey God, God will be with us again. Just as here, God reaffirmed them, when you put your hand into the plow and you start working on my temple, on my work, God says, I will be with you. So the work was resumed, the work was reaffirmed, and lastly, the work Rekindle, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. So the Lord stirred up, look at it, stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and also stirred up the spirit of Joshua and also the spirit of all the remnant of the people. God do a great stirring in the heart of the leadership as well as in the heart of all the remnant of the people that were there. And what did the Bible say? They all came together and start working on the house of the Lord. So that was the first message. The words of the prophet was directed to the hands of the people. So here in the first point, you see the people put their hand into the work of God. Now let us look at the second message. This time, the second message is directed to the hearts, to the hearts of the people. Chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 9. The people's heart, let me tell you, is very, very important. Your heart, my heart, that is your soul and spirit, is very, very important. When your heart is not right, when your spirit is not right, when your soul is not right, it will come out through your mouth. Yes, whatever comes out, it will also not be right. And this is what happened to the people here, especially those older generation. And because their heart wasn't right, what they say also not right. And these older ones, living in the time of Haggai, they were comparing that day, that day, with their good old days. And look at the effect that came upon 
the moral of the people right on that thing. Let us look first of all at the former house. Point one, former house. Chapter two, verse one to verse three. So God was saying to them, right at verse one, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, speak now to Zerubbabel and also to Joshua and also to the remnant of the people saying, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? Referring to those older generation, to the elderly people. And how do you see it now? Asking the older generation, the older people, in comparison with it. Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Are you looking at it? He was asking them. Are you looking at it as if like what they are building now is nothing? So God is actually asking these older folks with a very important question. Because these older folks, they have seen the great glory of the Solomon's temple. But then when they look at this, this uh, present temple that they are building, they were weeping, they were crying. And the older ones were saying, you call this a temple that we have built? You should see the temple which we have built during Solomon's days. Nothing com can be compared to that. The temple that we are building now is so small, not like the former days. In former days, the temple was much bigger, much glorious. And this temple is no match with that. So you see, by comparison, do you know what actually they have done? It dampened the spirit of those who work there. It discouraged the people. It undermined their work. Do you see the similarities of what is happening today? You see, sometimes there are people in the church, they are also behaving something like that. They always talk about the good old days that they have. They always look at the past and they never look forward. And this is the message to all of us as the people of God. Remember, you can look back, but don't live in the past. Don't stay in the past and don't compare the present with the good old days. Warren Westby said this, we all need to learn from the past, but we are not to live in the past. I repeat, we all need to learn from the past, but we are not to live in the past. How true is this saying? Isn't it true? We are supposed to learn from the past. We are not supposed to live in the past. May God help all of us that we will not be like this older generation, always live in the past and compare the present with the past. Let us break away from those things that are of the past. Yes, we have seen the former house. Now let's look at the present house. Chapter 2, verse 4 to verse 5. Haggai now speaks again. Haggai using God's word to put God's people on track and back to the work of the Lord. And this is what he said to God's people in chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. He says, Yet now, God said, True Haggai, Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, talking to Zerubbabel. Be strong, talking to Joshua. Be strong, and be strong three times. God said, be strong to Zerubbabel, to Joshua. Now he said to all the people of the land, he said, start work for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remained among you. Don't fear. Can you see what God is saying right here? 
Don't worry about what people say concerning the past. Look at the present. Look at the work that you are doing now. It is a very important work. Put your hand into it and continue to build, continue to finish the work which I have given to you. That's what God says to all of them. So number one, He promised His presence. He promised His presence. Look at chapter 2 verse 4. He says, For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. That is very, very important. Yes, we are building God's house today. It's very important to know that God is with us. Just as those days, they need to be assured that the presence of God was with them. Then in the same way, as we do the work of God, we must remember that God is with us. Yes, He's with you when you teach your children. Yes, He's with you when you're teaching His Word to all the life group members online. He's with you when you are doing the evangelistic work. He's with you when you visit people in the hospital. He's with you when you play instruments of worship in the church. He's with you when you are doing the song leading. Yes, He's with you when you even lead in the prayer line group. So not only God pro promised His presence, God also promised His power. Look at chapter 2, verse 5. So my spirit remain, remains amongst you. So don't fear. Aren't you glad that we have the person of the Holy Spirit that is with us all the time? Aren't you glad that He is your helper? Aren't you glad that He is with you? In John 14, Verse 16 says, the Holy Spirit is our great helper. Yes, He can help you in all things. What kind of things you may say? Number one, He can help you in your teaching and preaching. If you face problem, remember, seek the help from your helper, the person of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit can also help you in the choice of the song. He can help you to song lead. He can help you to witness. He can help you to pray. Yes, He can also help you to cast out demons. Yes, He can help you also to prophesy. He can help you in your work at the workplace. He can help you in your marriage life. He can help you in the way when you deal with your children. He can help your business. He can help your job. Yes, remember, Holy Spirit is your great helper. Turn to Him. Whenever you need help, turn to the person of the Holy Spirit and He will help you. Yes, we have looked at the former house, the present house. Now lastly, let us look at the future house. Chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 9. Now Haggai proceed to talk about the future house that Israel is going to have. But before that day came, what did God say? There will be a great shaking in heaven and on the earth, in the sea and on the dry land. You can read all that in chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 9. Now then he says, Prior before the second coming of Christ, there will be a great, great shaking. Then after that, the Lord will come back. Then he says, the desire of all nations, the desire of all nations, found in verse 7, he said, they shall come to the desire of all nations. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Who is this? The desire of all nations? Do you know who is it? It is referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the word desire. It is in capital letter. It is referring to Christ. He is the desire of all nations. 
But we know at this moment of time, people don't like the person of Christ. They don't like Jesus Christ. Most of them, they hate him. They want, they don't want to have anything to do with him. But the time will come when he returns. The nations that hate him will be removed out from the face of this earth. So what remain on this earth will be those who love the Lord and all nations will come to him as the word of God says. And he will sit on that throne. God says in chapter 2, verse 7, he says, I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Then chapter 2, verse 9, and the glory of this latter temple, that is talking about the futuristic temple, shall be greater than the former, even greater than the Solomon's temple, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place that is in Jerusalem, I will give peace to the whole world, says the Lord of hosts. Are you looking forward to the temple, to the future temple that's going to be there where Christ is going to sit there to reign during the 1,000 years rule on earth? I'm looking forward to it. I hope you too will look forward to it. So, we have seen the first message directed to the hands of the people. Then secondly, to the hearts of the people. Now thirdly, the third message is directed to the holiness of the people. Chapter 2, verse 10 to verse 19. First of all, let's look at the amazement. Chapter 2, verse 17 to verse 19. You can read all that. You see here, the people were amazed. Yes, the people were amazed. Why is there still no rain? Why there is still hailstones on the land? They couldn't understand. So they came to the prophet Haggai. They said, what actually has happened? Before you told us that there is no rain because we didn't build the house of God. So now we are building his house. But why is it that it, there is still no rain coming? So they were asking the prophet Haggai. So Haggai went to the Lord and asked God this question. And this is what God answered him. So point one, the amazement. Number two, the answer. Chapter two, verse 10 to verse 14. The answer came to the prophet. And I want to paraphrase what is found in verse 10 to verse 16. Basically, God is saying to the people through the prophet Haggai, with this word. Think of it. Suppose you take a rotten apple. You mix it with good apples. What will happen? Does the good apple make the rotten apple good or the other way around? What is the answer? The answer is simple. The good apple doesn't influence the bad apple. It is always the rotten apple or the bad apple that will what? That will spoil the whole basket full of good apples. The message is very simple. It's very simple. Simply saying this. Why is it that God is still not blessing them? Why is it that the harvest that they are looking for still has not come in? So God told them the answer is very simple. They are building the holy temples with their dirty hands. Yes, it's important to work for God. It's important to put God's work first. But then, your life needs to be right. Your life needs to be clean. You cannot build holy things with your dirty hands. So God is telling them, you want to serve me, it's good. But serve me with holy lifestyle. Don't serve me with unholy lifestyle. God said, get your life cleaned up. When you get your life right, and as you serve me, put me first, and as you live right, what happened? The blessing of God will sure fall on you. So the message is very simple. The message of Haggai, basically two things. Number one, God first. 
Number two, the second message, lies right. Lies right means lives need to be lived right as we serve him. So we have looked at the amazement. We have looked at the answer. Now we look at the assurance. Chapter 2, verse 19. So first of all, they were amazed. God gave the answer. The answer you know, was very simple. You're building the holy temple. Make sure your hands are clean. Make sure your hands and your life, they are holy before me. So now third point, the assurance. Chapter 2, verse 19. Once they put their life right, guess what happened? The rain came again. And this is what God said in chapter 2, verse 19. The last sentence. From this day, God said to them, I will bless you. Now listen, to all those of you who are serving the Lord, remember, as you serve God, your life counts. Your life is important. You need to live right before God. Yes, as you put His kingdom first, as you serve Him with your whole heart, remember, don't serve with one unclean heart, unclean lives, unclean hands. Let your life be cleaner as you serve Him. Because this kind of service will definitely bring the blessing of God. Because sometimes we think if we put God first, blessing will come. Yes, there's only part of the truth. The other truth is you need to live your life right. As you serve Him, you put Him first. Make sure you live your life right. And the blessing of God will come upon you. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. Many times we emphasize only the first part and we don't emphasize the second part. Remember, we must also seek His righteousness. Not only seek first His kingdom, but also seek His righteousness. And the Bible says, Matthew 6.33, all these things will be added to you. So we have seen the first message directed to the hands of the people, then to the hearts of the people, then to the holiness of the people. Now lastly, the last message, very quickly, it is directed to the hope of the people. Chapter 2, verse 20 to verse 23. This is the last message. And the last message is directed only to one man, and that man was called Zerubbabel. Chapter 2, verse 20 to 21. And again, the word of the Lord came, saying, verse 21, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. What was God trying to tell him? God told Zerubbabel, point one, other thrones will be removed. Chapter 2, verse 21 to verse 22. One of these things. Yes, God says, prophetically, one day all the kingdom of this world will be removed and overthrown and will be destroyed, saith the Lord. So not only he told Zerubbabel that other thrones will be removed, then point two, he also told Zerubbabel, lastly, that only a throne, only a throne will remain. Chapter 2, verse 23. And what will be the throne? The throne will be none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the closing verse. Chapter 2, verse 23. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, referring to Zerubbabel, he says, my servant, the son of Sitel, says the Lord, and will make you like a cynic ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. So God was telling this man, Zerubbabel, from you, the royal line of David is going to pass right through it. And that's where Jesus is going to come right through your line. And if you can check the Bible in both the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, 
the name Zerubbabel is mentioned right in these two portions of scripture. You got time? You can check it out. Number one, it is found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 13. His name was there. Zerubbabel's name was there. Is there. And also Luke chapter 3, verse 27. Luke chapter 3, verse 27. So from David came Zerubbabel. Then later on came the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus' throne will be established on this earth forever and ever. And his kingdom shall never, never end. Amen and amen. Shall we pray? Dear God, we thank you for this man called Haggai. Thank you for preserving this message of Haggai that has been given to all of us. Help us today to always put you first in our life. And I want to pray, especially for all those who are serving you at the forefront of the ministry, not only for our church, but for all the churches throughout the world. Help all of us to live our life right, to live our life holy, so that whatever we do, we can bring glory to your name. Bless each one of us as we depart from here. Bless all those who listen online. May this message be a reminder to all of us that we must always put you first at the same time. Live our life right as we serve you. We give thanks. We give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Amen and amen. God bless each one of you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. May his love, his peace, his joy, his grace, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen.